Okay, guys. Um, today we're going to learn how to do a legal memorandum from start to finish. And this is the type of legal memorandum that you will be writing for um, the certification exam. So I'm going to give you some tips and strategies. On the certification exam, you are going to have two hours to write your essay. Okay, I'm calling it an essay because this is a certification exam. And even though it's an essay in the form of a memorandum, there are structures and things that you would follow just like you would if you were writing an essay. So when you're taking a big test, you think about that long question at the end, rewrite it, you think of it as an essay. So remember, this is how you're going to respond to a test question. Some of what I'm telling you is so that you can tackle this test question in under two hours. And some of what I'm telling you, you can use anyway for the future for no matter what you're doing when you're writing something um, from the law. So my first thing that I'm going to tell you, um, and for those of you watching the video, this is on page 243 um, of the certification book that goes with the legal topics class. Or you may have a PDF version of it um, in your email. Um, you see on page 243, it starts out with some instructions, and then it gives you the memorandum, and then on page 244, you have some selected statutes. My advice to you is to read the statutes first. Always read the statutes first. You don't have to do that right now because we're going to get into that. The reason why I'm telling you this is you need to become an expert in the law before you understand which facts in the memorandum are relevant to your case. If you don't know what facts that you're looking for, seemingly all of the facts are important and you're going to waste some time and you only have two hours. Okay? You can get it done in two hours, but I don't want you to mull over something thinking, oh, well this fact is important and then you start reading the statutes and then now you wasted a whole bunch of time considering this particular fact. We don't want you to do that. So I want you to understand, first of all, before we actually read anything, what the format of the memorandum of law is going to look like. And I'm going to draw a picture for you. You can see in the book on page 243 that they give you that sample memorandum, right? Yours is going to look just like that. You're going to have the word memorandum. You're going to have to, from, date, and then a reference. In the book, this memorandum is to Michael Parkins' paralegal, and it's from Virginia Curlsman Newman, the staff attorney. Your question is going to be set up the very same way, but when you write your answer, it's not going to be from the attorney, it's going to be from the paralegal. Now, on the certification exam, if you put that it's from you, Courtney or Ryan or Robert, if you put that it's from you, they're going to throw away your answer because you're not allowed to put any self-identifying information in your answer in case somebody who's grading your exam happens to know you. Okay? So automatically, if you put your own name in this memorandum, it is going to be tossed out. So rule number one, don't put your name when you're typing up your memorandum as your answer. You are going to put whatever paralegal name they've given you in your fact pattern. And this particular fact pattern, um, it's going to be from Michael Parkin. Okay. And who's it going to be to? Virginia. Okay, and I'm just going to write Virginia. They gave her some really big, long name, of course. <laughs> okay. The date is going to be the date that you are taking your certification exam. So we're not taking the certification exam today, so we're just going to put today, which is June something. Anybody know what day it is? Yeah. 23rd. Oh, 23rd. Okay. And then we're going to put 2-0 because people are going to be watching this video maybe hopefully in 2019. Hopefully not. Hopefully I've made a new one by then. Um, and then your reference line is going to be the same as the one you were given in the fact pattern. In this case, it's going to be Landon Gray, Employment, uh, I think it says transition, termination. 
Now, I abbreviated, you are not going to do that on your certification exam. I abbreviated because I ran out of square space <laughs> in my picture, okay? So, this gets you points just for setting up the memorandum correctly. So, don't forget to do this. Set up your memorandum correctly, and then you're going to have an introductory sentence that's going to say something like, you know, and once we read our fact pattern, we'll know exactly what we're going to say. But know that it's going to be followed by an introductory sentence like, you asked me to do research on land and graze termination from such and such a place. Okay, just an introductory sentence. Okay, then we're going to go into facts. Okay, the issues, discussion, and then conclusion. A lot of students on the exam panic because they can't remember what order the memorandum is supposed to go in, and the fact pattern that you get doesn't have the order. Okay, I do not want you to panic. I just want you to remember F I. C. How do you remember that? You can come up with a silly sentence to help you remember it, and you're also allowed to have scrap paper on or scratch paper on the actual certification exam. So the first thing I would do when I would sit down is I would write down, remind myself, don't use your name, <laughs> okay? Um, read the statutes first, um, and then F I B C. That way you're not wondering what order you're supposed to actually put these in the memorandum of law. Um, three igloos don't, and give me something that starts with a C. That could conclude our sentence. Three igloos crush. don't crush. Okay? We just made that up. Okay, but it's F-I-B-C. If I just remember that before the certification exam, right before I go in there, I just do a little click, okay, three igloos don't crush. I only need to remember that long enough to write down F-I-B-C on my scrap paper. So that I know that's the order in which the legal memorandum is supposed to be um, delivered. I didn't say use the word written because you're not going to write it in that order. <laughs> okay, but you are going to present it in this order. Okay, so three igloos don't crush. And you can come up with your own funny sentence um, to help you remember. All right, so I said we're not going to write them in this order. I also said you're going to read the statutes first. The reason why we're going to read the statutes first is because we're trying to figure out what the issues are. If we know what the issues are, then we'll know what the relevant facts are, and then we can figure out what the answer is. What is going on with land and graze employment termination? At this point, we don't know anything. So we're going to look at the statutes because on the exam, they only give you statutes that you need. Okay, so you're going to have to ask yourself some questions. Why did they give me this statute? Am I going to use it? And how am I going to use it? And you can start thinking about these statutes that they've given you. And then when you read the fact pattern, it's really easy to go through and sort of get rid of all these nonsense facts that you don't really need that are put, being put in there as red herrings. Because what part of what they're testing you on is whether or not you can pick out relevant facts. All right, so I'm going to erase this. <coughs> And we're going to flip over to page 244, and we're going to look at our selected statutes. Now, they've given us one, two, three, four, five, six selected statutes. Okay? Now, we're going to want to become familiar with these code sections. Um, we don't have to memorize them, but when we refer to them in our memorandum, we want to make sure we're using the proper code section and we're using it appropriately. Um, because that's another thing that the people who grade your, your memorandum are going to be looking at. Did he or she refer to a code section while they were doing this? Okay. So, first one is section 15-245.
Okay, so section 15-245, let's look at it and see what it stands for. It says the government of the United Utopian States, we're not even in the United States, we're in the UUS, okay, is granted the power to assemble a military to protect its borders and its citizens. That sounds pretty serious, okay? Why on earth did Landon Gray get terminated? This sounds really scary. Um, the government can coin money. They can operate a post office system. They can protect interstate commerce. This sounds like the United States Constitution, right? Um, to ensure the right of citizens to pass freely from one state to another and to enact legislation in furtherance of these enumerated powers. All other powers are reserved specifically to the states and to the people. So what does this statute stand for? This grants authority to the UUS. Okay? So this is the note I'm making myself on the scratch paper. paper Because I haven't actually started typing anything in yet to my certification answer. I'm just sort of collecting my thoughts. Okay, statute number one, grants authority to the UUS, sounds pretty serious. Section 24-109, it says classification of crimes. The range of punishment that may be set for particular classification of crimes is, then it lists for us the punishment for felonies and misdemeanors in the different classes. Okay, so this statute lists punishment, I'll say penalties, for misdemeanors and felonies. Now, we haven't read the fact pattern yet, but do you think this is criminal law or civil law that we're dealing with? Criminal. Anyone? Yeah, criminal, right? Because we're talking about felonies and misdemeanors. So we know vaguely that this is about Landon Gray's termination. Do we think perhaps a crime might have been committed or he's alleged to have committed a crime? See, now we're thinking, okay, relevant facts, when we read the fact pattern, we're going to be looking for crimes. We're going to be looking for felonies and misdemeanors because why else would they have given us this statute? Okay, the, the people who design the fact patterns only give you the information you need as far as statutes, but in the fact pattern, they're going to put a whole bunch of crap in there and we'll see that you don't need it all. Okay, so section 52-115, okay, this one says a food product, food ingredient, or food additive exceeds statutory limitation. So they're limiting by statute food intake, okay, if its sugar content is greater than 10 grams, okay, all right, food, bad, if, okay, sugar is greater than 10 grams, okay, or, oh, well, we got an or here, remember or is very important in legal writing, that means it can be either or, it doesn't have to be that one, or its fat content is greater than 3 grams, or fat greater than 3 grams. All right, now we realize this is something to do with food. <laughs> okay? Any food item described herein, or any food item generally known for its high sugar content, or its high fat content, shall be known as junk food and thereby prohibited under the provisions of this act. Okay? All of this stuff in here equals junk food. That, and see, these are the notes I'm making to myself. So section 52-115 tells us what food you can and cannot eat in the UUS. We cannot eat, or well, it's classified as junk food if its sugar is greater than 10 grams or if its fat is greater than 3 grams or you notice if it is just generally known, okay? Um, they mentioned that in the, the, the last sentence, generally known for high fat sugar content. Section 52-714. It shall be a class 4 felony. Uh-oh. 
There we go. Class 4 felony. It shall be a class 4 felony to sell, purchase, exchange, ingest, or consume any high sugar or high fat food or food ingredient to, with, or by any employee within the jurisdictional boundaries of the UUS or its territories. All right? And, and we'll just use the word sell, even though we know there's all those other words in there. Sell, purchase, exchange, ingest. It was all kinds of stuff, right? Um, uh, let's say junk food. And look, it said to employee, right? Let me look at that again. It shall be a class 4 felony to sell, purchase, exchange, ingest, or consume any high sugar or high fat food or food ingredient to, with, or by any employee within the boundaries of the UUS or its territories. So this is specifically targeted at employees. It doesn't say, apparently anybody who is doing this with an employee, because it doesn't say an employee shall not with an employee. It implies that anybody. So even unemployed people, if they're selling employees food, okay, it's a problem under 52-714. It ends this, this statute with such foods likewise are banned from cafeterias, lunchrooms, meeting rooms, kitchens, vending machines, or stores located in or within 150 feet of any building that contains businesses with employees. All right, so you can't be within 150 feet of a building with employees. We really don't want employees eating junk food, apparently, in the UUS. We've got a real problem with it, and that's what these statutes stand for. Are we starting to feel like what happened to our client, Ted? Do you think maybe he's eating like a Susie Q or something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ho ho's, Twinkies, anything, something was going on at his place of work. Okay, because he got terminated, so he was in what? An employee. You can't be terminated if you weren't an employee first. Okay? So he was doing something. But let's look at 52-723. 52-723. What does this stand for? This says it shall be class three misdemeanor. It is a class three misdemeanor to accept, possess, procure, or solicit any high sugar or high fat food or food ingredient to, with, or by any employee within the jurisdictional boundaries of the United Utopian States or its territories. So you can't even accept, possess, procure, or solicit. It was a felony to sell this stuff, to buy this stuff, exchange or eat it, okay? But it's a misdemeanor if you just have it in your possession or you accept it. You're not buying or selling it, but somebody gave it to you, okay? So accept, possess, or solicit. I'm going to put those there. Accept, possess, or solicit. Do you think, using your critical thinking skills here, the reason why we have these two statutes is there's going to be a question about whether or not it was a felony or a misdemeanor? I see some heads nodding yes. Why else would they put that in there? <laughs> right? You have to ask, why would they give me this statute? This is how you beat the test. You have to be smarter than the people that gave you this information. Too often students sit down at this exam and they're terrified by this very long fact pattern and all these statutes that seem crazy. But you guys have been well trained. You know how to read these statutes. You know how to break them down and look for the elements. And that's all we're doing here, right? We're just doing a quick version of finding the elements. All right, one last statute. 67-4224. Now you notice these 52 ones were criminal statutes, right? The ones with 52. Um, 24 had punishment, 15 was something else. Now we're going to do a different code section in our UUS um, <laughs> statutes. So we know it's going to take a different direction. And it says, no federal statute or regulation shall impinge unnecessarily or limit unreasonably the personal liberty or freedom of any citizen 
unless the government can show a compelling state interest that cannot be accomplished by any other means, and the statute of regulation is narrowly tailored to satisfy the compelling state interest. So this says you must have a compelling state interest to limit just trying to paraphrase you. It says more than that, right? But, all right, so 15-245 grants authority to the UUS to create laws, right? They're granted the power to coin money, to operate the post office, to protect interstate commerce, to ensure the right of the citizens, to enact legislation in furtherance of its powers, blah, 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 right? Down here, it says if you're going to limit the freedom of your people, you have to have a compelling state interest. The compelling state interest has to be something that is really, really important, right? It has to be compelling. <laughs> okay? These two statutes kind of go together because they're talking about the authority that the government has. So one of our issues... Could one of our issues be whether or not the UUS actually had the authority to write these crazy statutes? Because doesn't this seem like you're restricting people's personal liberties by telling them what they can and cannot eat? So one of our issues might come from 15245 and 67-4224. Okay? So I'm going to write a little note to myself up here. Okay? Now one of the issues might have to do with the authority of U U S to write the laws governing food. Okay? Now that's not exactly what my issue is going to be when I write it in my memorandum of law, but again, I'm taking notes to help myself. Okay? So let's look at these other ones. Now, what do you think 24-109 is for? It just all it does is list the punishments for different classes of felonies and misdemeanors. Do you think once we decide whether or not there's a class whatever felony or a class whatever misdemeanor that we may need to talk about what our client might be facing? Okay. It also depends on whether they were selling it or accepting it. Absolutely. <clears throat> because one's class three, one's class four. Absolutely. Or did he eat any? Like, what did he do, right? So, issue number two, okay? Um, did, is his name Ted? Is it Ted? I forgot already. Landon. I don't know why I thought it was Ted. We'll go with Ted. Did Landon, I really thought it was Ted. <laughs> did Landon... Break the law. If so, felony or misdemeanor and punishment. Okay? Those are things we might want to consider, right? Number three. Okay, so we kind of took care of that. And we took care of that. And we took care of that. These. That leaves us with 52-415. What food is bad? Is bad or good? Because the food he was eating actually had that. Yes. Okay. So was food bad <laughs> under statute? We haven't read the fact pattern yet. Right? But we know so much already, don't we? We haven't even read the fact pattern. We've read the reference line that our guy was terminated. We know we're going to be researching this since we went to the law first and became experts on the law of UUS. Well, partial experts because we only got snippets of the law that, were, that was relevant to our fact pattern. <laughs> okay? We're super sleuthing and we are outsmarting the test writers. 
because we went straight to the source of the answer. We found the answers pretty much without ever reading their fact pattern, which is designed to confuse us. Okay? So now I'm going to erase my notes here because now it's finally time to read the fact pattern. But I'm going to keep those notes over there where my, these three issues are floating around in my head because now when we read the fact pattern, we can decide what is good and what isn't. What matters and what doesn't. Okay, and I'm actually going to write a big one over here. And remember, I'm still taking notes. I haven't even written any, I haven't typed anything into my machine yet. We've been doing this for about 30 minutes. I have an hour and a half left. Okay? An hour and a half left if I was writing a certification. One, two, three. Issue number one deals with the authority of the UUS to write governing food. So far in my draft in my head. Things I care about under two are going to have to do with whether or not Landon actually broke the law. Was it a felony or misdemeanor? And what would be the possible punishment? And the third one is, was this food even bad to begin with? Okay? So, let's look and see what the fact pattern Here's how you want to do this. Take each sentence. If there's anything meaningful in that sentence, keep it and then put it into a category. If it's not meaningful, scrap the whole sentence. So I'll show you how this works. Sentence number one. Our client Landon Gray has been employed by the district attorney's office for the state of anywhere for the last 22 years. There's one important relevant fact. What is it? That he works for the government? That he's an employee. That he works. Okay. You're absolutely right. So he's an employee. Which one of these, does this have anything with the authority of the government that he's an employee? No. Do you need to be an employee to violate those statutes? You either need to be an employee or you need to sell or procure or something with an employee, right? So. It's relevant to number two. He is employed. Okay? See how we're going to do this now? And if we're keeping organized before we ever start to write, the writing will be fast. Okay? Um, number two, the second sentence. He recently was fired for the unlawful sale of junk food at his workplace, and he visited with me this morning about his termination. Unlawful what? Sale of junk food. So he was accused of selling. And what did they think it was? Junk food. Do you see how I'm categorizing this? I put accused of selling under number two. Okay? And under number three was the food bad under the statute. They're calling it junk food. So his employer said he sold junk food, so we fired him. That makes sense so far? We good with how I categorize things? If you wanted to put junk food under here too, I don't care. Okay? It's your memorandum. It's all gonna end up in a hopefully an organized manner anyway. Landon is married and has three children, two of them in college. Anything relevant? No. No. If we hadn't read the statutes first, would you be taking notes on this just in case it was relevant? Mm -hmm. Yes, you would have, and it would have been a colossal waste of your time. <laughs> And you wouldn't have had the fancy categories to put it into. Okay. His youngest daughter, Chloe, is in middle school. No, not important. Chloe, uh-oh, sold nearly 400 boxes of Girl Scout cookies this year. Some of them to people in Landon's office. Daughter... We don't know. Okay. Da daughter sold cookies to employees. Now, what's our junk food? Girl Scout cookies. Okay. Okay. To help his daughter, because right here is the 
daughter being accused of the crime? Can you can you fire dad because daughter did something? No. But this is, okay, so this next sentence is kind of like, wait a minute. Okay. To help his daughter, Landon delivered boxes of Girl Scout cookies to co-workers from the trunk of his car over the lunch hour. Okay. Lunch equals delivery of cookies in parking lot. Uh-oh. <laughs> Landon! <laughs> okay. His car was parked in the employee parking lot. Car was parked in the employee parking lot. How are we feeling? I'm feeling sad for Landon. Next paragraph. When James Oliver, Chief District Deputy Attorney, heard about the delivery of contraband cookies, he called Landon to his office immediately. Is any of that relevant? Not really. No. Following a heated discussion, James fired Landon and ordered him to leave that very day. Is that really relevant? No, we already know he was fired. No, we already know he was fired. Okay. He's not we're not in this because he got fired. We're in this we're wondering if there was a reason to fire him. We know he was fired. Mary Littleton helped Landon put his personal belongings into a small file box and he left. Does that matter? No. Nobody cares about Mary Littleton. Here's the thing. If you hadn't read the statutes first and you hadn't organized your brain, you might think some of this could matter. And it's confusing you. Earlier this year, and in response to a WHO study showing that one in every five utopian workers is obese, the Federal Congress passed a number of statutes designed to limit workers' access to junk food at work. All right, that goes under one. Okay, WHO, World Health Organization, says fat utopians. Okay, in response, okay, U.S. enacts uh, laws to limit junk food. Do they have the authority? Did they have the authority to do that? Is that, remember, we, is it a compelling state interest? What, why are they doing that, right? Okay. The rationale was that obese people are less productive at work, miss work more often, and place a greater burden on the healthcare system. Okay. I'm not going to write that down. I guess I could. Obese equals less productive. Okay, that's what they said, less productive. Um, the Congress then declared the workplace a sugar and fat-free zone and encouraged employers to establish zero-tolerance policies for noncompliance. See, that's why Landon got fired. They wanted zero-tolerance because they wanted workplace compliance. Okay? Um, Zero tolerance. Landon Gray is a very physically fit man who works out three or four times a week. Are the statutes about obese people or are they about just about junk food? Doesn't matter how physically fit you are. I mean, a drug dealer doesn't have to do drugs to be a drug dealer. Okay, Landon doesn't have to be, you know, a cookie fiend in order to make sure that his co-workers remain obese and they're less productive than him. Maybe he's manipulating the whole system, we don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe this is his way of getting ahead, because they're going to be too slow to get you. Okay, um, so that is not relevant. None of the co-workers involved in this incident is obese, although several may be close to it. Again, it doesn't say obese employees, does it? employees. It doesn't matter about their level of fitness. Don't let these facts that seem like they might be relevant creep into your brain and confuse things. Because if we're just looking at the statutes, it doesn't matter. 
Attached are the statutes that says that I want you to consider reviewing this matter. Using these statutes, prepare a memorandum to me that evaluates the probable results of a legal proceeding on behalf of Mr. Gray. Look at this. The fact, the memorandum should include F, I, D, and C sections. Very often in the fact pattern itself, it will help you, <laughs> okay, <laughs> write your memorandum. And there it is. It lists them in the order that you need to have them, F, I, D, C. Okay, now we haven't written anything yet, and oh God, we're running out of time. Not really, because we're organized. Look, look how we whittled this down, right? Look how we took that big long fact pattern and we made it small, okay? Now, we are going to write our facts last, because we're gonna zero in on the issues and we're gonna make these issues make more sense. There might be more than three issues. We might be able to like stretch these out to four issues. Um, if we want to be as clear as possible. So, I'm just going to raise this part that says junk food. We'll remember that was Girl Scout cookies. Number three. Okay. Um, because I want to, again, draw a big box. Okay. And you have all the two from the blue blob at the top, right? And then you have the word memorandum, and then you have your introductory sentence. Remember I said that? Okay, then you are going to have a section that says facts. Then you're going to have issues. Okay, then you're going to have D for discussion. And then you're going to have a conclusion. You do not sign this. Why don't you sign this? Where is your name already? At the top. Your name's going to be at the top. So lessons are like, I want to sign it. No, it's not a letter. It's a memorandum. A memorandum does not have a signature at the bottom. Your name is at the top. It says it's from you already. Okay? Um, now, the reason why I draw this on here is because there's two sections that are going to be numbered. Okay? You are going to have your issues are going to be numbered. Now, right now, we're thinking three issues, and I'm also thinking, you know, because it's me, maybe four. I'm going to take one of those and make it two. Okay. Um, but let's say it's three. For each numbered issue, we are going to have a corresponding numbered conclusion to that issue. The issue really is just a question, right? Are Girl Scout cookies junk food? Conclusion, why, yes, they are junk food. Or, no, they're not junk food. Okay. But if that was question number one, the answer would be down here in conclusion number one. One, two, three. Now, I'm a fan of numbering everything so nobody's confused. Okay? Um, I might put numbers in here too as I discuss each issue because your, your discussion is really just, how'd you get that answer? You said Girl Scout cookies were junk food? Tell me how you got there. That's what this part's for, okay? That's the discussion. So if we number everything, issue number one would be discussed after number one, would be concluded after number one. Makes logical sense, right? But the people who grade this exam aren't as big a fan of having the discussion numbered. So you could probably put those in there and then go back and take them out. Even if you left them in there, I don't think it's enough to fail you on the uh, memorandum, but their format is numbered issues, numbered conclusions, but no numbers for your discussion. Okay? Even though you're going to, right, you're going to put the discussion in the order that you've got everything else, because how else would you do it? It would be very confusing if you did it a different way. And then the facts aren't numbered because they're just your relevant facts. Okay, so looking at issue number one, okay, Authority of UUS to write the laws governing food. Now, when we write issues, we want to be a little bit more specific because what aren't they allowed to do? They aren't allowed to write a law that limits your personal freedom, right? Unless they have a compelling state interest. So when we write our issues, we also, and I don't know if you remember this from legal research and writing, but they should always start out with the word whether. Okay, um, so sorry, you guys can remind me what was under here. <laughs> I 
need my space, okay? So looking at number one, our issue might be whether the United Utopian States had a compelling interest sound half decent? It doesn't have to. You guys are writers too. But we're in a hurry. <laughs> okay? Um, we want to do the best that we can and we don't want to mull over every word and say, oh my god, this could be worded perfectly. If you find yourself in that mental state where you are trying to word everything perfectly, you are going to run out of time on this exam. This is not an assignment that you have two weeks to write. Okay, you have two hours. We've already spent a lot of it. Now I've been jabbering, okay, so we're 45 minutes in now, <laughs> okay? I've been talking a lot. You're not going to be talking and explaining things while you're doing this, okay? So it's going to move a lot faster for you, okay? All right. I hope I just didn't turn that off. It seems to still be recording. still recording if not. <laughs> okay, so whether the United Utopian States had a compelling interest to limit the food intake of its employees. Okay, we don't have to answer that question right now. We're still writing issues. Okay, numero dos. <laughs> okay. Um, did Landon break the law? If so, um, was it a felony or a misdemeanor and what was the punishment? Okay, so now if the U.S. did not have a compelling state interest to even write this law. We don't even need to get to these other issues, but we kind of do anyway. <laughs> because what if the court or somebody else finds that we're wrong and they, they did have a compelling state interest to do so? Okay, so we haven't really answered that question yet even for ourselves. Um, but I just wanted to point that out, that you know how you word things um, in your discussion are going to be, you know, if a compelling state interest was found to have next then looking at Landon's actions, you know, we think what will we want, okay? So, numero dos, number two, whether Landon, is it Landon Gray? Whether Landon Gray violated Well, let's just list the statutes. Um, no, sorry. Whether Landon Gray violated the statutes, the statute, the statutory limitations. How about that? <laughs> On junk food. Now, if we were in a legal writing class, I would encourage you to get more specific and to take this a step further. But we're taking a test on this, okay? Um, because I would want you to say, like, whether Landon Gray violated the statutory limitations on junk food, where his daughter sold Girl Scout cookies to people he worked with and he delivered them from the truck of his car. Okay, I would want you to put more crap in there, <laughs> okay? Um, so the question is whether or not he violated the statutory limitation on junk food. And then we can get into a discussion about whether or not um, we can get into a discussion about whether or not it was a felony or misdemeanor right here, okay? So actually, I'm going to leave that as just a, the whole second issue because we can discuss that whole thing in there, okay, and make a determination. And number three, was, were the Girl Scout cookies even bad under the statute? Whether Girl Scout cookies.
like that. Okay? Now, let me ask you this. Do you think this order is the best order in which to list these issues? Do some of them depend on other ones? Like, for example, if the if, if, if UUS didn't have a compelling state interest, we don't really need the rest of this, but we kind of do. But then what would be the next thing that you look at? Yeah, probably if the Girl Scout cookies were actually junk food. And then we could say, if the court finds that the Girl Scout cookies were junk food, then we have to determine whether or not Mr. Gray actually violated those laws. So this is why we're drafting, okay? Um, and I kind of did that on purpose because I want you guys to think that only took, what, a second for Courtney to give me that answer, okay? So... That's really the order in which it probably makes most sense logically. It's going to help you with your discussion, too. It's just going to make logical sense. Because if the Girl Scout cookies aren't contraband, then what? Then he isn't guilty of anything now, is he? Because the statutes regarding uh, the misdemeanor and the felony are reliant upon whether or not it was junk food. Okay, that's one of the elements. It had to be junk food. All right, so... Any questions about the issues and where we got them? And I've, I've made this mental decision not to break this down into uh, two separate issues. There also could be a possible second issue here. We're on a time crunch. Okay. <laughs> and they're going to be forgiving. They want to see, can you think logically? Can you present an argument? And can you pick out relevant facts in a two-hour time period? Can you put something on paper? I guess that the courts would forgive in the parking lot. <clears throat> because the, yeah. the, the code doesn't say anything about a parking lot. It doesn't say anything about a parking lot, but it has that within 150 feet. And then. It could be like very far. It could be a very, very far away oh, parking lot. You're correct. I would kind of stick that all under here. Under this one, where did he buy, did he actually violate it? I mean, did he do these things? But yeah, I see exactly where you're where you're. You could break the two um, different <clears throat> like the misdemeanor and felony. Misdemeanor and, and felony into two separate issues. You could also do that, okay? Um, and actually, this one here, the compelling state interest, talks about you know what laws could be enacted, but it is possible that they don't even have the authority to write laws like this to begin with. Because it's not part of interstate commerce, it's not part of the military, they're not coining money, they're not operating a post office system. Like, if you read through this, um, all other powers are reserved specifically to the states and to the people. They may not even have, and we're going to talk about that, but that could be a separate issue. Did they even have the authority to even write this type of law to begin with? Because it's not one of their enumerated powers. Secondly, if they if it does somehow become one of their enumerated powers, did it serve a compelling state interest? So there could be two issues there as well. But we can discuss those here in the, in the same thing. What do you guys think? Do you think that their compelling state interest, that obese people make less productive people, therefore in order to... Uh, control this problem, they're limiting junk food. The world, the WHO just had a study saying that junk food is not obese. They just have a study saying specifically that <clears throat> they're less productive or um, they can harm the environment. So that's just an assumption. It's just an assumption. So arguably, <clears throat> That obesity is not a compelling state interest. Okay, arguably we could we could make that argument. How do we think a court might find in the UUS? <clears throat> there are no statutes in the UUS. I think we can't assume that they're possibly biased. You think they're they're probably biased in this sense already? 
What if it wasn't obesity? What if they just uh, thought that you, you know, you guys can have water. <laughs> Employees don't need water. It makes them pee more often. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So these are the types of things that might be running through your head. And if we had two weeks, we would delve into all these issues. So we have to quickly choose a sign. The test designers don't care if you say it's a compelling state interest or not. I'll just tell you. <laughs> they don't care. All they care about is whichever way you go that you can support it with facts that you found in the fact pattern. Okay, so for the sake of argument, let's just say yes, there was a compelling state interest. Okay, all right, so for conclusion number one, it would be yes. <laughs> okay, um, and I'm going to go ahead and show you how to write that quickly. <laughs> Okay, so dealing with issue number one, our conclusion is yes, the UUS had a compelling state interest. Okay, um, so what you would refer to um, is IRAC. You're going to use IRAC to guide you. Remember IRAC? Issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. Okay. So our issue is whether the UUS had a compelling um, interest to limit the food intake of its employees. Okay, so oops, um, whether or not. Um, so you want to say we said yes. So we're going to say the UUS had a compelling. about had the authority um, and a compelling state interest to limit the food intake of its employees. When you are writing a legal memorandum, you're going to your issue isn't going to be in the form of a question in the IRAC format. Okay, it's going to be in the form of a statement, which supports your conclusion. So our conclusion was yes. So our statement is we're throwing it out there. The UUS had the authority and a compelling state interest to limit the food. Um, I think it's supposed to be of its employees. Oh, food intake. Okay, food intake of its employees. That's the I in IRAC. R is going to be the rule. So we're going to refer to section 15-245. Uh, okay, and grants the UUS the authority to enact legislation and section 67-4224 provide that freedom, freedoms can be limited if a compelling state interest exists. Now, if you were in my legal research and writing class, I would want quotes, I would want direct quotes from these statutes, but we only have two hours. And you are typing, and if you are not a fast typist, you should have started typing a long time ago already, okay? If you are not a fast typist, you may need a different strategy than what I'm showing you here. Do not handwrite all of this out. I'm handwriting because I'm trying to show you how to do it. But you're sitting in front of a computer. You can edit and move things around. Once you start writing 
your discussion, once you have these issues, they should be in there, one, two, three. You know what I'm saying? And once you have your discussion, you start typing it. You're typing this now. Okay, because you know where you're going, because we, we took notes already to kind of get you moving in the right direction. Does that make sense? So you should start typing, because I've had people run out of time because they wrote it all on their paper, but they never put it into the test thing. That's sad. Okay? Don't be that person. Okay? So, the UUS had the authority and a compelling state interest to limit the food intake of its employees. That was I. R is the rules. 15245 uh, grants the UUS the authority to enact legislation and 67-4224 provides that freedoms can be limited if a compelling state interest exists. Analysis. They're obese. <laughs> UUS. Based on a report from the WHO. Okay? The UUS, based on a report from the WHO, found that obesity, because they didn't use the words less productive, that was me. But what they said was, well, they actually did use less productive. The rationale was that obese people are less productive at work, miss work more often, and place a greater burden on the healthcare system. Okay? Found that obesity causes low productivity. Productivity. Um, absence from work. And what was the other thing? And a burden on healthcare, and a burden on the healthcare system. That's our analysis. We applied the, the facts to the law, right? So we did in the compelling state interest. Now we need a conclusion. Thus, you just started always with thus. <laughs> thus, or you can say based on the foregoing. It can be fancy. Okay. Thus, UUS had a compelling state interest. In legal research and writing class, I would want you to go much more in depth. There's more there. Okay? And I might even ask you to find that they didn't have the authority. Okay? But we're taking a test. <laughs> okay? So, we're taking a test, so we want to make sure that we get rational thought in there in a logical manner using IRAC. That people will understand when they're grading it, they'll be like, oh, look at her, she analyzed, she concluded, what a great student, A, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so that will be, so here's number one. This is discuss, that's issue number one, discussion number one. When it comes to the conclusion number one, I just wrote the word yes on that big square that I have here, but it would be yes. UUS had a compelling state interest. Period. Okay? Alright? So we're going to do the same thing with whether Girl Scout cookies are junk food pursuant to UUS. Okay? Using IRAC. And we're good. We have about 30 minutes left. And actually I've been talking for an hour. I've been doing this for one hour now, and I want to get it done in an hour and a half. If I can get it done in an hour and a half while we're talking, you can get it done in two hours with no problem. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. All right. So, numero dos. Whether Girl Scout cookies are junk food pursuant to UUS laws, for our I, we're going to make a statement. We're going to turn this statement into a question. Do you think it's junk food? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, I think it's probably junk food. We can make the argument that it's not because we don't have the ingredient list. But it also in the statute says if it's usually considered junk food or food. Any food item described herein or. So any food item that has those parameters with the fat and sugar content, remember, or any food item generally known for its high sugar uh, content or for its high fat content is junk food. So. Girl Scout cookies. Girl Scout cookies are junk food pursuant to UUS law. Period. Rules. 
52-115. Section 52-115 states that any food generally known, right? the rule. Analysis. Take the facts from the fact pattern, apply them to the rule. They're Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> <laughs> They're Girl Scout cookies. Everybody knows, okay, that Girl Scout cookies are delicious. How are they delicious? They're high in sugar and fat, okay? It is generally known that Girl Scout cookies are high in sugar and fat content. As such, we're going to be see, as such, Girl Scout cookies are, yeah, you can say illegal. I was going to say junk food, but you can say illegal. That was an easy one. Yeah. Just so, <laughs> yeah. just so to, we're not just talking about one. Well, yeah. that's the next one. This statute only tells us what is junk food and what it defines junk food. Okay. So our question was, is it junk food? And the answer is yes. So for our conclusion, so this would be number two. That's number two. Our conclusion number two would be yes. Girl Scout cookies are junk food. Right? Okay? Yay! All right, next. See how quickly we're moving now that we have our system in place? I'm watching the time. Very excited about it. Okay, number three. This one's going to be a little more advanced. There's more to it. It could actually be two separate issues if we wanted to be like that. Okay, but never forgetting IRAC. Whether land and grave violated the statutory limitations on junk food. So now let's revisit these statutes for a second. A class four felony would be if Landon, if Landon sold, purchased, exchanged, ingested, or consumed. Did he do any of those things? He didn't personally sell, purchase, exchange, ingest, or consume. Um, looking at the rest of it, the food was also, is also banned from cafeterias, lunch rooms, meeting rooms, kitchens, vending machines, or stores located in or within 150 feet of any building that contains business with employees. It, they were in the trunk of his car. As Courtney pointed out earlier, even though we're dealing with the 150 feet radius and the parking lot is probably within 150 feet, did they specifically enumerate parking lots? They did not. He did it during lunchtime, but it wasn't in one of those enumerated places. Do we think he committed a felony? No. So right now, the answer is no. But let's move on, because we're asking, did he violate any of the statutes? It shall be a class three misdemeanor to accept, possess, procure, or solicit any high sugar or high fat food, or food ingredient to, with, or by any employee within the jurisdictional boundaries of UUS or its territories. Possession. Possession. Maybe the solicitation would be the greater than that one. The solicitation would be what his daughter did. No, we know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's not about her. Mm -hmm. Now, what if one of you decide to go off on a crazy tangent about how he's the dad and he's responsible for what she does? What's the problem with that? It's not in the fact pattern. It's not in the fact pattern? Well, it is in the fact pattern. Yeah. But, but like where isn't it? They would have given us a statute about parental authority and parents being responsible for the acts of the children if they wanted us to talk about that. Right? 
Do not go off on some crazy tangent because you think you know the law better in the U.S. This is a fake place. The only laws that they have are the ones you've been given. Do not do that. You will screw up your essay. Because I know some of you out there are thinking, oh, but the dad should be responsible. No, he's not under these statutes. It's just all about him. So are we thinking he possessed contraband? Um, and he's an employee within the jurisdictional boundaries of the UUS. So the answer to our question is whether Landon Gray violates the statutory limitations on junk food, the answer is yes or no. Yes. Yes. But when we do our analysis, we're going to be specific about what Boy has done. Okay? So our issue is Gray violated um, uh, and we'll be real specific here. 52-723. Section 52-723 um, by possessing Girl Scout cookies. No, it's not for I and R cookies. I'm sorry? Because would that go for like the I and the R? Well, and I'm going to go into, and the reason why I did it this way, and that's a very good question, um, because this this is me just saying, I, I want to make it very clear at the outset that I don't think he committed the felony, but we're about to, under the rules section, we're going to give both felony and misdemeanor. Okay? We could totally skip the felony, um, but they gave it to us, so they probably want us to rule it out. That's why I said it could possibly be a separate statute or a separate issue. We could say, because it could be whether or not he committed a felony. And then our answer would be no, and we would discuss why. And then another issue could be, did he commit a misdemeanor? Yes. And then discuss why. Um, so, but stylistically, we chose this route. And I'm just telling you, it's right either way. As long as you hit everything, you should be fine. But that's a really good question because it does contain rules in there. We could have just said, Gray committed a misdemeanor by possessing the cookies. Okay? It's still kind of the same idea. All right. So, Gray violated section 52-723 by possessing Girl Scout cookies. Rule. Section 52-723 um, uh, defines uh, misdemeanor violations. Violations related to junk food. And section 52-714 defines felonies. Section 52-723 um, provides that possession is a violation. Section 52, and see this gets a little complicated, which is why it could have been two issues. Section 52-714 um, requires selling, um, purchasing, ingesting, or more involved actions with junk food in order to constitute a felony. Now, I've done this on purpose. Okay? What if right now we decide God, I should have made this two issues. Do you go back and do that right now? No. <laughs> right? You made your bed. You're going to lie in it. Okay? Because I still have time.
But I'm trying to do this in an hour and a half in my head. I got 15 minutes. <laughs> okay? I only have 15 minutes left when I look at the clock. Now, in real life, I still have 25 minutes. Okay? But don't you think I should get it all down first? <laughs> okay? In case I run out of time or something weird happens, okay? I just want to get this done and on paper. This is acceptable. It's not as fluid and it's not as clear, but I can do this. I'm competent enough to do this. Okay, so let's look at where we're at. Gray violated section 52-723 by possessing Girl Scout cookies. Section 52-723 defines misdemeanor violations relating to junk food and 52-714 defines felonies. It's really not all that complicated. <laughs> 52-723 provides that profession, possession is a violation. I skipped all the other stuff. I'm summarizing. Okay. Section 52-714 requires selling, purchasing, ingesting, or more involved actions with junk food in order to constitute a felony. See, I'm starting to make the argument here. I'm moving into A. We don't have that. Okay. We simply need to state at this point for our A in the IRAC, because we finished the R. The R was just a little bit longer than normal. Okay? The A is Gray did not do any of the more involved behaviors which would result in a felony conviction. Okay, didn't do it. All right, now we say what he did do. However, Gray did possess the cookies. However, Gray did possess the cookies. in violation of 52-723. Now, there is one statute we haven't talked about yet. Now's the time. What have we decided this is? It is a class three misdemeanor. 24-109 tells us what? Pursuant to section 24 109, Gray is facing 60 to 180 days or $50. Now we're projecting the time. Don't leave any of the statutes out when you're writing your answer. They're all there for a reason. None of them were just thrown in there as red herrings. That's what I've discovered with these test takers. They throw the red herrings into the fact pattern, not to the statutes. Use them. Find a way to work them in, but work them in logically. Don't just throw them in, just throw them in. That was a logical place, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. Thus... Gray, what was the question? Violated. Thus, Gray violated the statutory limitation. On junk food. Now, this was number three. So, that was discussion number three. Conclusion number three. Yes. Yes, he did that. <laughs> okay. And you just say that he did. This one, because it comes with a, a punishment, you could even say, yes, and, you know, criminally he's facing blah, 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 blah. You could throw it in there, too. Okay. We put it in the discussion part, but we could also put it in the conclusion. Okay. So those were our issues. Um, there could be another issue. Was he lawfully terminated? Right? 
zero tolerance. But that was in our fact pattern. Is there a statute that says zero tolerance? No. 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 It was not a statute. Okay? But you could put that in there, whether or not Gray was lawfully terminated. We don't have any statute to back it up. We'd say, we can't answer that because we don't have a statute that, that specifically says whether or not this was lawful termination, although we do have in the fact pattern that there was a zero tolerance initiative. Zero tolerance initiative. Plus, cr violating the law generally, what are we doing as I'm spouting all of this stuff? Are we basing it on any statutes? I'm imagining statutes, right? I could put all of that in there. I'm not saying it would be wrong, but they would be they would be saying you're taking a leap of faith. Okay, what have we written yet? Facts. Right? We did the issues, the discussion, the conclusion, the conclusion. We saved the facts for last. Oh my gosh. Let me erase this. We saved the facts for last. I'm gonna use the black marker because it will be easy to actually see it. Okay, now we save the facts for last because we only want to include relevant facts. Okay? I like to use the issues to guide me as I'm writing the facts. So issue number one was whether or not um, the UUS had authority to um, limit the food, whether or not there was a compelling state interest. Okay? So... If we say the UUS had a compelling state interest and we put that as a fact, that's not really a fact. Isn't that a legal conclusion that we came up with during our, <laughs> during our discussion? A fact is a fact, okay? Where did they find their compelling state interest in the World Health Organization? The World Health Organization has determined that obese employees are less productive, miss work, and place a burden on the healthcare system. That's relevant to our issue where we said they had a compelling state interest. We're not going to say there was a compelling state interest. That comes later. These are just facts. Things that are facts, that are real, that happened, or didn't happen, or whatever. But they're not analysis of facts leading to legal conclusions. We're just simply stating them. What did the UUS do in response to this report, factually, historically? The U.U.S. enacted junk food laws to what? To combat employee obesity. Cover issue number one? Yeah. yeah. Issue number two was Girl Scout cookies. Okay? How do we get there? How do we start talking about the Girl Scout cookies? We just say Girl Scout cookies are bad for you. No, that's a legal conclusion. Girl Scout cookies are Girl Scout cookies. Do we need to start talking about what happened with Landon? Yeah. Because really, issue number two and issue number three, what Landon did, they're pretty much combined. Girl Scout cookies are whatever, okay? So, Landon Gray. An employee delivered Girl Scout cookies to his co workers from the trunk of his car during his lunch break. That sound about right? Could you say something about the Girl Scout cookies? Because that could be like, 
uh, just like delivered the post up to the solicitor general in order to uh, they go to prison. <laughs> well, you could Girl Scout cookies. You could say known. Girl Scout yeah. cookies are generally yeah. You're right. Girl Scout cookies are generally known to have a shot has your brain and background on that. Let's do that. Girl Scout cookies. Yes, you were right. Girl Scout cookies ah, are generally known to have a high sugar fat content. Landon Gray was subsequently charged. mention his daughter. We don't need to. She's not relevant. We don't mention that he's physically fit. It's not relevant. We don't mention that some of his co-workers were almost obese. <laughs> we don't mention that they had a heated argument when he was getting fired. Who doesn't have a heated argument when they're getting fired? Most people do. None of that is relevant. They even said that some woman helped him carry a box out to the car. Remember that? Who cares? Doesn't matter. None of it is relevant. And that's why you write the facts last. Because they're really going to be looking to see if you know the difference between a relevant fact and not a relevant fact. We came in at just under an hour and a half, and I've been blabbing. So... <laughs> You have two hours to tackle a similar type of a question fact pattern. If you follow the steps, what do you do first? You read the statutes. You take notes on the possible issues associated with those statutes before you ever read the fact pattern. Number two, you read the fact pattern and you categorize according to the issues you've developed where those facts fit logically. Number three, you start, you write the issues and maybe you have to reorder them, okay? But you write the issues using the word whether. After you type out, I'm saying I say type now, because once you wrote, once that's up, you type that in there, okay? Then you type the discussion for each well, then you determine what your answer is, yes or no, yay or nay, okay? Then you go to the discussion portion, and you're going to type that discussion using the IRAC formula, issue, rule, analysis, conclusion, okay? Then you make sure that your conclusion is done for that issue. You move on to the next one, and you do that. Maybe you have four issues, maybe you have five, maybe you have two, I don't know. It depends on the fact pattern. When you are all done with that, you write your facts last. Then you go back and you make sure that you've got to, from, date, reference. You make sure that you didn't put your name in there. And you also make sure that you have that introductory sentence that says, you asked me to review the file of Landon Gray and to look at the issues associated with his termination. Right? and you're done. And then you hit submit. And then you go home and you wait for your um, results six weeks really later. <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, now, because they take about six weeks to grade your essay. Yes. Now, are we going to be typing this in like a Word document and then submitting it that way and like uploading it? or is it Very good like question. Important? It's actually going to appear, the question, the question was whether or not it was going to be, um, you're going to type it up in Word and you're going to upload it. You're not going to upload it. You are given a window. It's, it's going to be much like a word pad. So you're not going to have all your fancy word processing things, okay, that you can normally do. Um, but you still can cut and paste and those types of things. Um, but it's just going to be a window, and that's the testing window, and that's how it has to be submitted. It's kind of like typing in an email, and you have a limited functions on things that you can do. Okay. Um, any questions? Great. Wonderful. Thank you.